thank you very much for this introduction and thanks a lot for the invitation. When I received it, I thought, wow, what a wonderful opportunity. I'm in Kiev now as a Fulbright scholar and I thought it would be cold in Kiev and warm and nice in Washington, D.C. It turned the other way around. It's wonderful weather in Kiev. But uh, of course, I'm, I'm not disappointed at all. And one of the reasons for me, not just being not disappointed, but being excited is the, the idea that went into the title of this conference, and this is about frontiers of freedom. Uh, the term frontiers for the regions of Eastern Europe and North Caucasus is not a new one. But how you define them, I teach a course on frontiers of Europe. A colleague of mine wrote a wonderful book on part of Ukraine, which has <coughs> a title, A Place of No Name. We're talking about the captive nations. And, and frontiers of freedom, that gives actually a new meaning, a new purpose to the region, but also uh, helps, helped me, at least as a historian, took uh, another look at, uh, at that region and maybe rethought it, what, what happened there, what is going on today, and what we can expect in the future. And in very general terms, what unites the, the, that region, which is de geographically is, is basically not, not a contiguous place, is the fact that it used to be for a long period of time the borderlands of the Russian Empire and later became the borderlands of the Soviet Union. And it is now uh, exactly in those areas, in those regions, where the question of the reintegration of so-called Eurasian state, that's, that's the task that was put forward by President Putin before his, his third coming to, uh, to power. That's where that fight and that struggle is taking place. What is interesting about that is not just that it is a battleground, but this is a battleground in which we see uh, uh, in, in contest a number of very important concepts. One of them is, of course, uh, authoritarianism and democracy, because in absolute majority of those countries, we see the, the uh, democratic process, which is not perfect, far from being so, but certainly is developing. And another thing that uh, the, the people are, are the player there. It's the areas where just a deal with the leadership, a deal with the president doesn't, doesn't uh, um, uh, take you far. That's where the people go to the streets and express their desires and in that sense uh, democracy democracy lives there and attempts uh, in Ukrainian case for example there were there were two attempts to introduce some form of authoritarian regime and both of them ended in uh, in uh, um, uh, to Maidans and, and in Georgia, in case of Georgia, we have, we have those examples as well. So I was invited as a historian and given an absolutely impossible task to cover the entire period, at least 2,000 years of history, uh, within 15 minutes. And uh, I, will, I will try my best. I, 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 I am not sure whether I will be able to accomplish that, but I certainly will try. Uh, one of um, graduate students in our Department of History wrote a wonderful dissertation on the way how the media evolved, in, in particularly in Central Europe. And what I learned from that dissertation was that the way how you see articles being uh, framed today is uh, really came to the fore in the 19th century when there was a telegraph. And the idea was the telegraph, the, the communication can be broken at any moment. So the idea was that the gist of the article would go into the first paragraph. So when the communication broke, the, the people on the other side of the line still would have something to publish. So I'm, I'm going to use the same technique in a sense that I will tell you what I would like to talk about, about in, that, uh, in that short presentation. And if I'll stop before achieving that goal, then hopefully maybe in the, in the discussion, in the question and answer period, I will be able to come back to that. So overall, there are four things that I, I thought worth talking about in that particular context, the context that I just described. So the first one is about the, the cultural origins of the region and how it relates to the cultural tradition, partially state but mostly cultural tradition, in um, the center of the former empire and in the center of the former Soviet Union in Russia. Uh, 
the uh, second theme is the, the state and state building and empire building in Russia and how and in which way those territories were acquired and how they adjusted or didn't adjust to the imperial rule. The fourth would be the Soviet period and the fourth uh, the, the, the third would be Soviet period and the fourth post-Soviet. So I'll start with, with, the cultural, with the cultural developments. And one thing that it's important to keep in mind, whether we are talking about the um, uh, East European part of our um, geopolitical space, which would include uh, Ukraine, Belarus, Moldova, or we are talking about North Caucasus and in particular Georgia, what we see is that the cultural origins uh, in, in, uh, and traditions in these places. First of all, they're old and they're more ancient than the one that would appear later in Moscow. And the second, they're absolutely autonomous from, uh, in, in their origins autonomous from what would be happening later in, in Moscow. And Georgia in this case is a, um, uh, certainly uh, particularly, particularly important. We have the acceptance of Christianity. We just discussed that in the fourth century. We have the literature that is being established there. In Kievan case, of course, this is the history of the of the Kievan Rus, and again the, the development of uh, literature, the, the the creation of the church, the, the 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 creation of the first princely dynasties, with the help of the Normans, which are happening which are happening in Kiev, and in that sense that 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 differences and 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 uh, between what later would become the center of the empire and center of the Soviet Union and those peripheries they would stay there they would stay for centuries this is very different from the situation for example in Central Asia where certainly in the Russian Imperial times in the Soviet times the mission was of bringing civilization to those areas it's it's very different with the North Caucasus and with parts of, of Eastern Europe um, uh, the, the area that I know the best would be, of course, Eastern Europe, the, the, area, the, the, the part of the world that includes Ukraine, Belarus, and, and uh, Moldova. And what you see there is that these areas, they are part of the all European cultural processes starting with the 15th, uh, 14th, 15th, and 16th centuries. So the Renaissance, we have, uh, we have the architectural monuments coming from the Renaissance uh, um, era in that, in that region. Reformation brings a major, major cultural shock and uh, uh, major debate discussions and explosion of published texts, uh, split of the Orthodox Church into the Orthodox and Union churches, uh, Reformation and Counter-Reformation work there as well. So neither Renaissance, not Reformation, Counter-Reformation are not part of the European processes that Russia goes through. When Russia uh, embraces for the first time the first all European, uh, European development, which is enlightenment, then most of the cadres that are starting this process in the late 17th and early 18th century, they're recruited from what is today Ukraine and Belarus, more specifically the alumni of Kiev, of Kiev Mohila Academy. Why this is important or not important? This is important in the sense that these regions for a long period of time relied either on themselves or on the other sources of learning and other sources of inspiration than the one that would come eventually from Moscow and from St. Petersburg. And this is pretty much the, the dominant trend and the story all the way into the 18th century. With the 18th century, the situation changes and it changes with the rise of Russia as a European power and the creation of the, of the <coughs> Russian Empire. Uh, it, becomes, it becomes partially a European power with the help of those cadres from, from Kiev Mohila Academy that I was talking about. Uh, Theofan Prokopovich, one of the chief quote unquote ideologists of Peter uh, I and his reforms, he is just a, one of many examples of that, uh, of that um, uh, process that is taking place at that time. Second half of the 18th century, 60% of all medical doctors in the Russian Empire would come from Ukraine and Belarus. The reason they, they knew Latin, they, it was easier for them to go abroad and come back and then practice medicine there. But 18th century is the part of the expansion of the, of the Russian Empire. And it is the time of the integration and incorporation of the regions 
in uh, Eastern Europe that I just discussed, in North Caucasus and Georgia in particular, 1782, the first agreement on the protectorate, Russian protectorate of, of Georgia, and that's the first time that that particular part of the region, which is historically quite, quite different and quite independent from what was happening in the uh, Russia-dominated uh, space, that for the first time that they become part part of that space, dominated not culturally yet, but certainly politically, and that process continues in the 18th century with really uh, full integration, both the uh, East European borderlands and uh, borderlands in uh, North Caucasus. But before that happened, all those regions, they experienced a period of the autonomous development within the Russian Empire. So the, the integration of Georgia was not happening overnight and with uh, the integration of the Cossack formations that were created in today's Ukraine, that process took at least 150 years. Um, so you have again, even even within the Russian Empire, you have different 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 uh, traditions which are rooted in, in, in medieval and early modern period. 19th century is a different era in a sense that in new, new sources of inspiration, rise of, 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 of nation and national identity come to the fore. And that's where Eastern Europe becomes really a battleground between the Russian imperial project on the one hand and the Polish project on the other hand. The Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, the, one of the most powerful states of the early modern Europe being partitioned by the end of the 18th century, but with the state gone, the, the cultural and political influences over the region continue. And if you go today to Kiev and see the monuments to St. Volodymyr and see monuments to Bogdan Khmelnytsky, it wasn't the Ukrainian nationalists or proto-nationalists who built those monuments there. Those were the Russian imperial authorities who in that way established the Russian claim over the region against, against the Polish rule and control. So the area is a battleground. Both North Caucasus and Eastern Europe is a battleground, and despite the integration and political control of the Russian Empire, the battle, cultural battle, continues all the way into the late 19th and 20th century. Now fast forward to the Soviet times. Well, uh, the Soviet Union was created in December of 1922. And, uh, at that time, two projects on how to create that state that would become the, the, uh, major, the major power, especially during the Cold War, two projects were, were discussed. One backed by uh, Joseph Stalin, who was saying that, well, basically we have the Russian Federation, let's include uh, North Caucasus and let's include Ukraine and Belarus on the same rights that Tatarstan, for example, has. and. Uh, there was a significant, significant already progress on, the, on that road to creation, this big Russian Federation. That was the idea. But there were two troublemakers in that, in, in, in that whole story. The first one were the Georgians, and the second one were the Ukrainians. So those now communist elites, they rebel, and they demand actually much more rights, and Lenin backs them and creates a, a union of the Soviet Socialist Republics where at least pro forma, Ukraine and, and later Georgia and, and even later Estonia have the same rights as Russia. And Russia for the first time gets and acquires its own territory, which is separate from the territory of the empire or separate from the territory of the Union. For the first time they acquire their own institutions. So the formation of today's modern Russian nation really starts with this Stalin losing debate to, to Lenin in 1922, and again Lenin in, in, that, in, in, the, in that particular context backs the, the, the rebellious republics, which happened to be Ukraine and, and Georgia, which is very interesting given what is happening today and what happened later around, around the time of the disintegration, disintegration of the uh, Soviet Union. More in the case of Ukraine and uh, Eastern Europe, less in the case of Georgia, the 20th century witnesses also uh, the, the, the major battles, political and military battles over that region. The Second World War, Ukraine, Belarus, Moldova become the battleground. 
in the in that war uh, the, w w some of the most important uh, some of the most important battles of the war are being being fought there the war is over in 1945 maybe it is over in berlin with the uh, um, red banner on the on the top of the reichstag but it goes on for another 10 years in ukraine with the ukrainian insurgent army which gives you how difficult even for super authoritarian dictatorial regime of Joseph Stalin, it was actually to, to uh, strengthen his hold on, on the parts of Ukraine, in particular Western Ukraine, which before that were part of Austria-Hungary, which before that during the interwar period were part of, of Poland, where a particular type of nationalism was uh, 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 developed, which was different from the communist type of communist Bolshevism that was in Eastern Ukraine. And again, I, I'm, I'm mentioning these things to, to stress one point, that this battleground situation, that this continuing competition between different different political and cultural projects, it continues, it may be started somewhere in the Middle Ages, it, it strangely somehow continues all the way into the 20th century, it continues into what is happening, what is happening today. Now, uh, before they switched off my mic, uh, the, 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 the post-Soviet period, and that's uh, where the, the entire conference, I, I understand, will be taking place, and that's where uh, uh, Ambassador Volker certainly will, will um, talk about that, and he has much more expertise than I have on that. But I want to bring two from the historian point of view, two very interesting and potentially productive parallels with the historical parallels with situation today, which maybe can help us to, to start the discussion and, and uh, ultimately understand, better understand of what is going on there. So the first parallel is the parallel of the interwar Eastern Europe. And interwar Eastern Europe, this is the emergence of the new states on the ruins of the former empires, from the, from the Austria-Hungary uh, to the Ottoman Empire to the parts of the Russian Empire and Baltics in particular and Western Ukraine and Western Belarus. So the, the, the states that emerged there on those ruins of the empires, they were building their, their statehoods. They were recreating, reinventing their nations. Most of them eventually, one way or another, fall into, into the, the trap, into the situation of the authoritarian rule from Poland to Romania. We know that quite well. Uh, most of them would actually take more territory that they were able to digest, and they faced all problems with the minorities. Eventually, in, in, the case, in the case of Poland, we know this is the most dramatic case of one country being lifted and moved uh, geographically from one location to another, and again, that was related to, to the, uh, to the uh, minorities as well. And another, another useful parallel is the parallel with the Eastern Europe, the same part of the region, a little bit further west from the countries that I discuss now, the same part of the region during the Cold War, where it became really known and established as Eastern Europe and became, and became really a battleground during the Cold War years. But all parallels, they have their limits and, and how far you can bring them, how much you can get out of making these comparisons. And today's our situation is different from the Cold War situation with Eastern Europe. First, those territories, with the maybe exception of, of Crimea and, and Eastern Ukraine, were never conquered by the, by the uh, in, in this case, Russian army. And second, most of these areas till today actually continue to resist authoritarian tendencies within those states and within those governments where people uh, acquired and still and still have this power of their voice and where they are players and where, where they put on the agenda of the local elites but also on, on the agenda of international community questions that otherwise wouldn't be there. So from that point of view, I don't think that we could come up with a better title for, the, for this conference than Frontiers of Freedom. Thank you very much for your attention.